Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. First, let me uh, just wish everyone a happy Women's History Month. Yes, inclusive of all women. I know that we um, have a lot going on, but it's really important that we recognize this month. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. You know, I know we've been sitting down for the majority of the morning, and the speakers have just been phenomenal, but I'd like to get us up out of our seats if we can, so let me just explain a couple of things. Um, don't get up yet. <laughs> so you likely see an envelope on your chair, an empty envelope that has a, uh, a card inside. This is purposeful. I would like you to write your name and address. So address the envelope to your home. And during the session, I want you to write down one or two things that you choose to implement in your daily life as a part of being more of an inclusive leader. So you'll hear me talk. If there's something that resonates with you or something that you think you want to incorporate in your daily life, just write it down on the card. And at the end of the session, put the card in the envelope and leave it on your chair. We will collect them and mail them to you 90 days later as a way to hold you accountable for what you have committed to doing. So that's one activity that we're going to do. And as we get started today, I am going to read a series of statements. And if the statement resonates with you, if it is reflective of who you are, I will ask you to stand for a quick second, if you can. We'll look, observe the room, and then just take your seat. So we'll do that to see how much diversity is actually in this room, and I imagine there's a lot of it. So try not to overanalyze my uh, statements. Just listen to them, and if they resonate with you, stand up, pause, and take a seat. So let's get started. You consider yourself a traditionalist or a baby boomer? <laughs> Thank you. You consider yourself a millennial or a Gen Zer? Wow. Thank you. You are Hispanic American, Latino, or of Hispanic descent? Thank you. You have or a family member has a visible or hidden disability or impairment? Thank you. You grew up in a neighborhood that was almost exclusively white. Thank you. You would consider yourself Jewish. Thank you. You have ever been ashamed of the way that you looked? Thank you. You have ever had to use a personal vacation or sick day in order to practice your religion or spiritual beliefs? Thank you. You were raised by a single parent or you are a single parent? Thank you. You could obtain or borrow over $100,000 within 24 hours if an emergency occurred. Okay, I'm memorizing these faces. <laughs> <laughs> you or someone you know very well is gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. Thank you. You would consider yourself Muslim. Thank you. You are or have been responsible for the care of elders in your family. Thank you. You are an immigrant to this country. Thank 
Thank you. You have ever been given a job or a promotion without having to compete for it? Thank you. As a child, you were told not to play with children of a certain race, religion, or ethnic group. Thank you. You assume that people are heterosexual until you find out otherwise. Thank you. You are Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, or of Asian descent. Thank you. You have felt any form of pressure to be silent on issues of diversity. Thank you. You come from a family where alcohol or drugs was a problem. Thank you. Neither of your parents attended college. Thank you. You are African American, black, or of African descent. Thank you. You now have or have ever made your primary living by manual labor or working with your hands. Thank you. You were drafted or enlisted in the armed services or national guard of any country. Thank you for your service. You have a flexible work schedule that allows you to come and go freely. That's why you guys are hanging out here today. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you have ever withheld telling your manager that you were an expected parent because of the lack of potential for advancement. Thank you. You have changed your preferred dress, appearance, speech patterns, or cultural traditions in order to fit in. Thank you. You are concerned about how your age has or will affect your career. Thank you. You or someone in your family has a learning disability. Thank you. You do not have any children. They look so rested, don't they? <laughs> My goodness, they look great. Um, you are East Indian, Pakistani, Middle Eastern, or of Middle Eastern descent. Thank you. You have ever found yourself in the minority in any given location or situation and felt uncomfortable? Thank you. You have ever witnessed verbal or physical abuse of a stranger who was perceived to be gay? Thank you. You have hidden part of your identity in order to protect yourself or to fit in. Thank you. You have ever been the only one of your gender or ethnicity in your peer group or team. Thank you. You would designate your race as other. Thank you. You are white or Caucasian. Thank you. 
You are Native American, American Indian, Alaskan Native, or Inuit. You feel that having children has been or will be a liability to your career. Thank you. You consider yourself as analytical. <laughs> I mean, it's the People Analytics Conference, guys. <laughs> Here's a trick one. You cr uh, consider yourself creative. Okay. Yes. And last but not least, you are committed to learning more about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes. Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. Um, Thank you all so much for participating. I find that this exercise is extremely important as we learn about one another. I also think that it's very important to participate if you feel comfortable, because what I realize every single time that I facilitate that is that I can never tell what people will stand up for. I might be able to take an educated guess on a few issues, but nine times out of 10, the level of diversity and dimension that each of you bring to the table is not noticeable to the naked eye. And I think we have to remember that as we are navigating some of our experiences in our corporations and even in our daily lives. We are so dimensional as human beings and that, that is really what makes each one of us unique. A while back I wrote a blog post and I called it seven billion differences. And the reason I called it that is because there are seven billion people in this world and each person is unique, even identical twins. There are different facets of our lives that make us special. And so we have to figure out how to hone in on what good attributes people bring to the table and then figure out how to leverage those things. So I wanna share a couple of experiences that I've had in corporate America around issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion with you and some of the tangible takeaways that I took from each experience. So I'll start with the National Football League. I was an HR generalist at the league and supporting all of the revenue generating groups, which included marketing, sales, consumer products, events. And we had an opportunity to pitch Pepsi to be the beverage sponsor for all 32 stadiums. It was a $30 million deal we were confident that we were gonna be able to lock the deal in because at the time, uh, the NFL was the number one sports property in the United States, earning more revenue than the National Basketball Association, the National Hockey League, and Major, Major League Baseball combined. Um, we generally showed up very strong on these type of pitches, particularly if they were cross-functional pitches, and so we didn't have any uh, concern that we weren't gonna be able to win. And so part of the way that we put these cross-functional teams together were to work with the executive committee and the human resources team so we could talk about top talent. We could look at uh, data with regard to performance reviews. We could talk about um, our subjective, oftentimes, uh, values around what people needed to demonstrate in order to be successful and then ultimately work together to create these cross-functional teams. And so I remember this one example very specifically because while we were having the discussion about talent, there were words that were recurring and they kept being used when we talked about who had the ability to be successful. Words like Wharton educated, Harvard educated, worked at McKinsey, so they bring a level of strategic ability to the table. Varsity lacrosse, all of these things were, were being socialized as we determined who had the potential to add major value on this pitch team. And I remember raising my hand and interjecting a few times and saying, well, what about her? What about this historically black college graduate? And I was met with gentle resistance, nothing overt, but gentle resistance. Um, usually something like, well, we'll think about them next time, but this is a, a really important pitch and so we wanna make sure we're bringing our strongest to the table. So ultimately there were a ten, a 10 people that were selected for the cross-functional pitch team. All 10 of the people were men. 
all 10 of the people were white and all 10 of the people were heterosexual because the words that we were using to describe people's lived experiences and what would make someone successful ultimately laddered up to these 10 individuals who were very smart, by the way. Uh, there just could have been other people who were also asked to weigh in. And so they went and they worked for about six weeks, putting together their materials, working cross-functionally, and they ended up going to Pepsi's headquarters to meet with the chairperson of PepsiCo at the time, Indra Nooyi, and her executive committee. And what happened on this day was, was very rare and something that had never happened in the history of the NFL going on a pitch. Immediately after, Indra said, unfortunately, we can't do business with the NFL at this time. And the reason that we can't do business in this capacity is because we are standing up a global organization with uh, representation across several hundred countries in the world. And part of the way that we speak to our customers is through cultural competency, making sure that when we are putting together marketing materials and when we are creating campaigns and things that resonate with them, that we actually understand what, what matters. And so part of that means that we have to reflect these different places. And that's why she intentionally had an executive team of practitioners that hailed from across the globe. Brazil, Australia, Canada, Korea, India, the list goes on. She intentionally set up teams of global practitioners that had cultural competency to ensure that PepsiCo was speaking the language of the people that they served. And so with that feedback, uh, the group of gentlemen came back to corporate headquarters, informed Commissioner Goodell and others that we did not secure the business, and everything changed that day. Um, Commissioner Goodell was obviously very upset. Um, he had an aha moment that perhaps we need to start thinking about talent differently, talking about talent differently, changing our lens towards what we value. And so we started a diversity council. But the Diversity Council, in my opinion, was formed in a hurried fashion, and it was not a strategic manner. There were people that were handpicked to be on the council, myself included, uh, because of the visual diversity that we brought to the table. Not necessarily because we were culturally competent or experts in anything, we just happened to look different than the norm. And so in our best effort to get some work off the ground, we worked together and we came up with a few, I would say, tactical programs that were good for the time being. But the culture never really shifted. The culture really never shifted. And so there's a phrase that many of you have probably heard, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And that's exactly what we were experiencing. Strategy is just words on a paper. But if you don't have the people inside of your organization to make that strategy come to life, then that's all it is. So there's a real emphasis and, and a focus in my work on shifting cultural norms versus writing a strategic plan. I think a strategic plan is important. That's why I have you all writing down some things that you want to incorporate into your ways of working. We have to have words on paper, but we also have to have the people inside of the organization be able to stand that up. Several years later, I decided to leave the NFL and I went to a company called Edelman. Edelman is the world's largest PR agency. It is now considered an integrated marketing agency. And I led diversity, equity, and inclusion at Edelman, the first person ever. And I remember the day that I got a phone call from Alston and Bird, a big law firm in the Atlanta area that happened to be one of our clients. And this call was quite different than most of the calls because we served them in a PR capacity, but they said, this call is different. We actually don't need PR advice for our firm. We just acquired a legal client that we're doing an investigation for. And this client who we can't say, you know, we can't tell you who this client is just yet, but they are a sports organization and we believe that they will be going through a public facing racial crisis. We have every reason to believe that what we just learned will be released to the public 
and we think that you might be able to help them from a crisis perspective and from a DEI perspective. And so I went to Alston and Bird's office about an hour later and met with the client. The client was the CEO and the general counsel of the Atlanta Hawks and State Farm Arena organization, which is a national basketball association team. And they began to, this was back in 2014, by the way, summer of 2014. They began to tell me about emails that they had discovered that were being written by the general manager of the franchise and also emails that were written by the controlling owner of the franchise. And these individuals, over the course of several months, were disparaging the black fan base. They were talking about ways to make the arena more white um, and ways uh, to ensure that there were uh, players on the roster that were not reflective of bad African countries. While that was going on, there was an audio call where the board met with one another to discuss some player moves. During that audio call, the general manager read a scouting report. And in the scouting report, it referenced one of the players in the NBA. His name is Luel Deng, and he is from Sudan in Africa. And it said that he should not be added to the roster because he is African, and because African people cannot be trusted, because they do illegal things, and it would not be good for the team's reputation to bring someone of this background onto the roster. What they didn't realize was happening during this call was that it was being audio taped by one of the other owners. And in the state of Georgia, only one person has to be aware of an audio recording for it to be admissible in court. And that can be the taper. <laughs> so, the taper, um, he used this tape as leverage because he knew that uh, this could be very damaging to the franchise if anyone found out. And so he approached the controlling owner and some other executives and said, I have this thing taped. I'm going to release it to the public if you all do not sell your controlling share of the team and make that known in the next 72 hours. So you're on the clock. So the question for me in that moment from the CEO and the general counsel after we signed papers and NDAs and everything, the question for me was, do you think that this is going to become public? Is this getting out? What should we do? And I said, well, you have 71 hours and 30 minutes left. Uh, they're serious, you know, people don't make these type of accusations or, or um, don't threaten organizations unless they are really prepared to come out. We just saw this two months prior with Donald Sterling in the LA Clippers, if you all remember that situation. And now here we are in the city of Atlanta, Georgia, the home of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the city that has been coined too busy to hate. And we have this happening at a national basketball team, association team. Uh, so I said, we need to be prepared to put a strategy on paper for how we are going to address this. We need to address this with the commissioner. We need to address this with our fans, our sponsors, our employees, every single person that touches our brand. And so the day that we decided um, as a coordinated crisis team to come together and release the story, uh, that was my counsel. I said, we need to release this story. We need to own what we have done as a team. We need to let the public know everything that we know and let them know that we're conducting a legal inve investigation to find out the rest of the facts. And once we know where the facts lie, we will be prepared to have different actions around how we have comported ourselves in this space. And so the day that we uh, leaked the information to the press was NFL kickoff Sunday of 2014. Strategic because we know that in the world of sports, the NFL is king and that everybody would be tuned into what was happening with the NFL that day. Not a little local basketball team in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so we told the story, NFL kicks off, 
you know, we didn't get a lot of traction, which was a good thing in the world of crisis. But then later that day, Joan Rivers passed away. And so she almost took over NFL kickoff. Um, and so our story got a little bit more buried. And then later that night, Ray Rice physically assaulted his fiance in an elevator and dragged her into a car. This all happened in one day. And the NBA had a racial crisis. So our story never became national news the way it did in LA because there was nothing happening in the media that was so big that could overtake the LA story. But for us in Atlanta, people were paying attention. And so I remember saying to the CEO, I said, you need to hire a chief diversity officer. This is a great opportunity to take a tragedy and turn it into a triumph. Empower a practitioner to do this work and to turn the perception of this city around, turn the perception of this team around, and create real inclusive moments. At first, he did not agree. He came around and said, I'm going to hire that role. I decided that I wanted to apply for it, and I did. A uh, few months later, after several interviews, I became the first chief diversity officer in the National Basketball Association. So I left my job from Edelman to do this work. I knew that it was a, a very, very uh, risky thing to do because there was no template for success. We were in the middle of a very publicly shameful uh, scenario. And I'm not necess I wasn't necessarily sure that there were people that were going to help support us. And so on my first day of work, I remember the head of PR asking me to come to the arena because there were people picketing in front of the arena, upset that I was there, upset that I decided to take on this job that had never been done before. And they wanted to talk to me on the record and they wanted to know what was my five-year plan. And so I ended up going to the arena. And as I looked at all of those reporters and all of those special interest groups and people from the 100 Black Men of America and the SCLC and the Rainbow Push Coalition, I remember thinking back to my NFL days when we had a diversity council that wasn't put together in the most strategic way. So I said on the spot, I said, well, the first thing that we're gonna do is put together a council but our council is going to be different than most diversity councils that you see in corporations. Most diversity councils that I have um, had a lens to are made up of only internal employees. And they're generally people who are passionate about the work, maybe not experts in how to make this strategic plans come to life, but, but passionate. And, and oftentimes they hail from di different demographic sets and different departments and things of that nature. But for me, I thought there was a better, a better way. I wanted to engage the public to become part of our diversity council. So I created a diversity council that had 50% internal employees because we needed that internal knowledge. We needed to know historically what's happened in this organization, what works, what doesn't work. We needed that institutional knowledge. But I also thought that we needed to engage the public because there were people out there that were demographic set experts that had insights into the, some of the communities that we knew nothing about. Historically, in, in professional sports, professional male sports, the LGBTQIA plus community had not been embraced. There were people in the public that not only were experts of that community, but they wanted to help bring us into the community in real and organic ways. So I needed to make sure that we were engaging with people on the outside. And so ultimately, the council had 50% internal employees and 50% external uh, that were all demographic set, set experts. And we started to get to work. And we worked in three work streams. We focused on internal engagement for the employee experience to ensure that there was equitable experiences across the board inside of our house. We also focused on external engagement and fan engagement because we wanted to make sure that the Atlanta community felt served by the sport of basketball, that we were showing up in the right ways. And then lastly, supplier diversity. Who are we doing business with? How are we selecting organizations that uh, win bids? Is the process fair? Are we ensuring that we're giving money across the board to organizations that can work alongside of 
us. And we made a lot of tangible change in, in the five years that I was there. We were the first NBA team to march in the Pride Parade. But for me, marching in the Pride Parade was just the start. We started to have deep engagement with the LG, LGBTQIA plus community in ways that no other sports franchise in the Atlanta, Atlanta area did. And then we started to see an uptick in the people from that community coming to our games. Um, people that were reaching out to us organically to say thank you for creating a home for us in the world of sports. We never really felt comfortable anywhere else. We worked with our merchandise team to create, um, I would say, products that were reflective of what that community wanted to see in themselves. And we made material uh, progress in the black community that felt very harmed by what initially happened. And so now, eight years later, there are 21 NBA teams that have a chief diversity officer because we were on the ground, even though we were just in the Atlanta area, we were going from franchise to franchise to talk about our best practices and some of the things that could be implemented across the board. It wasn't about us winning. You know, generally in, in basketball, there's one champion at the end of the year who wins the trophy, but that's not what this work was about. It was about sharing, um, being, 100% transparent, owning up to our mistakes when we were wrong, and celebrating communities that had been unseen and unheard by us. Um, many years later, I left the MBA and I went to Starbucks, a small little coffee startup in Seattle, and um, I was the chief diversity officer there. And when I got to Starbucks, it was January 2020. And then February 2020, a month later, COVID hit Seattle, where my whole entire family just relocated. And it was one of the most challenging um, times for me personally, but also for the organization. I think um, there were a lot of things that were transpiring because Starbucks was trying to be an organization that was on the front lines for uh, many healthcare workers that were coming in that needed their coffee at 4 a.m. before they got started on a long day to uh, help serve all of the citizens that were impacted by the pandemic. Um, when you have a big brand on an international stage like Starbucks, the public is looking for solutions, and, and oftentimes we didn't have answers. And so that created some outrage. A few months later, George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis, and 26 of our store, Starbucks stores were destroyed that night in Minneapolis, um, vandalized, spray painted. It was horrific. Um, but I think that moment required us to dig deep, and we had to we had to, to say, what are, what, what are we going to do in this moment? And we had a uniform policy in place where employees, what we call employees, partners, were not able to wear any type of paraphernalia on their green apron. Um, but a lot of our partners asked us if they could wear Black Lives Matter on their apron because they felt so many strong emotions around what was taking place and they wanted to show solidarity with the community. And we had a really, really tough decision to make because in one instance, we didn't want to violate what we called our principles um, in terms of the uniform policy and making an exception for one, which means that we might create um, energy to have to make exceptions for others. But ultimately, we did. We changed the policy um, just for a period of time. I think it was a couple of weeks where we allowed employees to express themselves in this manner um, while we created our own branded uh, t-shirts so that we could ensure that we were keeping things uniform. But I think what we learned in that moment is that sometimes there are situations that occur in the workplace and occur in our corporations that um, are so alarming and are, are creating dialogue around cultural shifts and changes where we have to be malleable. And just because a policy worked 50 years ago does not mean that it's going to work today. So for all of our people analytics and, and human capital consultants and folks that are working in this space, I think the main message is ensure that you're being malleable and that you're really looking at how things and people evolve over time and try to evolve your policies with things. Um, you're, we're not always gonna get it right. 
Um, there are some things that will require us to go back and iterate, but I think that having a mindset around change, evolution, and inclusion should always be top of mind. So now I find myself at the Recording Academy, which is the home of the Grammys. And I specifically chose to work in the music industry because I think that music is universal. It's a language that we all speak. Um, there are different genres, of course, and so there are obviously different art forms and ways to express through music, but generally speaking, music brings people together. You can go to a concert and look across the entire arena and see differing people having a great time. And so we are now choosing to use our platform of music to bring people together so that we can take that energy and unify. Most recently, I went to Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, my husband and I went on a trip a couple of months ago and we do not speak Portuguese at all. And we found ourselves in a nightclub dancing one night to a local band that was performing on the stage and they were singing in Portuguese. We cannot tell you what they were singing about, but we felt the beat of the music and it felt nice and it felt good. And there were people in the audience with us that did not speak English, but when you share a smile and you look at someone in their eyes and share an embrace, that's a good feeling. And so that is what we hope to use our platform for at the Recording Academy now, is to take music and find ways to amplify communities that have been underserved. Most people don't understand that the Grammys is just one night, right? Just one night where we celebrate musicians in a telecast that have certainly come to the highest point in their career and, and deserve to be celebrated. But for the other 364 days of the year, we are doing things around the clock to ensure that there is a platform for musicians who come from underserved communities to be finally served. When you think about the fact that there are 22,000 members in the Recording Academy, most of them will never get a Grammy. Most of them will never be a part of our telecast. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't find ways to celebrate them. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, talk about their stories, share their stories. So my charge to you all as we uh, wrap up, number one, be an ally. Allyship is so important and so critical as we move through these spaces and places. Oftentimes people on the margins are not able to reach their maximum potential because there was not a person in the room that was willing to speak on their behalf when they weren't in the room, or someone to just help shepherd them and guide them along the way. So if you can pay attention in your organizations to who's not really talking, who's sitting quietly in their seats, I wonder what's on their mind. Figure it out, go talk to them, extend a hand. Most of the people that have become extremely and wildly successful in their lives had an ally. They had someone that saw something in them and helped them. I would also say we have to, as practitioners, practice the art of being inclusive. A lot of times people ask me, well, what can I do at my job to be an inclusive leader? And my answer is simple. You have to be an inclusive leader in your real life before you can go to work and try to be an inclusive leader. So what does that mean? I have three small children, and I take my three children to a homeless shelter in Atlanta every other week, and we donate our toys to the children that are there. We spend quality time with some of the mothers and the women that are there. We um, give food when we can. I make sure that my children are being raised in an environment where they are used to giving to others that are different than themselves, and they are used to having a level of empathy for others that are marginalized. We have to practice this. We can't say in our head that we wanna be good leaders and not do it on the weekend and show up to work on Monday and think that our whole entire lived experience is through the lens of our corporation. Because if it's not really in your heart and it's not in the core fabric of who you are and how you show up, it will be inauthentic at work. Steph Curry is arguably one of the best shooters um, 
in basketball history. He's very talented naturally, but he will attribute his success to practice. He has over 10,000 hours of documented practice shooting the ball. On any given day, he practices shooting six to eight hours a day. And that is why he has not missed a free throw shot in the past four seasons, not one because it is subconscious now. He has done it so many times that it is just part of the way that his body knows how to move. He, he's a practiced veteran. We have to do the same thing when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We can't go to two hour trainings at work where we click through PowerPoints and hear a couple of lines from a facilitator and believe that we have been trained to be inclusive leaders. You've got about 9,998 more hours to go if that's the case. So those are my key takeaways for this audience. I think that you all in this room are poised for greatness in this space because you're proactively educating yourselves. Just by the mere virtue of you showing up today to the Wharton School People Analytics Conference to learn more about not only data, but the people part. How does this resonate with the human beings that we touch every day? You all are poised for greatness. So I challenge you again, write down one or two things that you want to challenge yourself to do differently. Put it in the envelope. And when you seal it, seal it with a good intention. Knowing that it's coming back to you. Knowing that you're holding yourself accountable. And knowing that you are going to ultimately change people's lives and change the trajectory of what we experience in the workplace. Thank you all for your time and have a great conference.